to look at what is uh, apologetics. I don't mean to have my back to you guys, but kind of is what it is with the setup here. So we'll look at uh, a couple of questions. Why apologetics? So a lot of times when I talk to uh, either newer Christians or maybe even people who haven't had mu much exposure to Christian theology or uh, in the church, when you talk about apologetics, they always have some misconceptions. And so we'll look at exactly what is apologetics, uh, why should Christians study apologetics, sometimes we even get kicked back in the church for that, uh, why the church should teach apologetics, uh, why evangelism needs apologetics, and if we have time, we'll look at the uh, Ambassador's Creed. So I'm not sure if that, I don't think that clock is working, so I'll just have you give me a heads up every now and then on our time. So we'll start with what apologetics is not. So one of the most common misconceptions is, why are you apologizing for being a Christian? You know, you should stand up for Jesus. And so my, my one funny joke of the night is, and I made it up on myself, I didn't steal it from anybody. Though there are some sorry Christians, you should not be sorry for being a Christian. So apologetics is not walking around and being sorry for being a Christian. Um, apologetics is also not trying to pick a fight over every theological issue. Now, some apologists, and rightly so, they get a bad name because it seems like uh, they just want to nitpick over every little theological hair, every little thing that uh, is a disagreement, whether it be the age of the earth, um, end times, eschatology, that's a favorite for people, um, Calvinism versus Arminianism. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying those are not important topics, because they are, they are important. Uh, but there is liberty. Christians have liberty for that. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a good Southern Baptist, Reformed Baptist. Uh, Pastor Ware is a good Lutheran, so we're going to have some disagreements on certain things. But we're still brothers in Christ, right? We still hold to all the essentials of Christian doctrine. So one of the things that I love about Ratio Christi, uh, being non-denominational, uh, the, the organization is, we really try and stick to what are the essentials of the Christian faith. So things like the doctrine of the Trinity, right? That's an essential because we have to know who is God. Um, you know, you have some groups that may claim to be Christian, even Jehovah's Witnesses uh, may claim to be Christian, but they have a different uh, view of Jesus, and we would say a different God. Mormons, the same thing. They would claim to be Christians, right? The Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus, you know, uh, Jesus Christ. Well, we would say they have a different Jesus. Uh, and so on, on certain essential doctrines, that's where we, we really have to come together. The physical resurrection. Um, I would say uh, faith alone, salvation by faith alone. Um, that Jesus is coming again, right? There are certain essentials, the, the, the timing and stuff like that of when Jesus comes. That can be debated. People can have positions. But um, our main focus is we just want to kind of as C.S. Lewis talked about with mere Christianity. We want to really be united in the uh, essentials of the Christian faith. So we're not trying to pick a fight over everything. All, also, apologetics does not replace uh, the preaching <clears throat> and the proclamation of the gospel. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you can't, you can't argue anybody into the kingdom of heaven. You can't argue anybody into being a Christian. And that's true. That's absolutely true. You can't love anybody into being a Christian either, though, right? And a lot of times when they say that, it's this more of this emphasis on love. You can't do anything with uh, somebody apart from God the Holy Spirit. So to say that God cannot use um, logical arguments or rational arguments to bring someone to him or to you know knock down obstacles so the person can see the gospel clearly i would say is mistaken god can do that he did that with me you know i grew up in a christian home i had a lot of uh i think there's someone outside the door had a lot of questions um you know growing up as far as uh you know did god create the universe is evolution is is that what's responsible uh, is the bible reliable you know my grandfather he was uh yeah, you know, he was an atheist. He did, he did not believe that God existed. And so uh, that caused a lot of confusion for me. Uh, and so getting some of these answers, I can remember the time. I'm, I'm watching a, a debate between uh, Gary Habermas and Anthony Flew 
uh, and they're talking about the resurrection. And Anthony Flew is a well-known atheist, written a lot of work in, in academic journals. And uh, it's funny, he reminded me a lot of my grandfather because he came from, you know, he's from England and my, my grandfather was from England and just this sweet little jolly old man. Uh, but he was, he was a razor sharp uh, philosopher and he was an atheist and he was uh, having a discussion with Gary Habermas, who was a Christian historian and uh, probably the, the foremost defender of the resurrection. And just seeing the defense of the resurrection was like, I'd never seen anything like it before. You know, so for the first time, you know, I'm seeing reasons to believe. I'm told my whole life what to believe, but I had never really been given answers as to why I should believe it. I remember just being astounded the first time I actually heard there was historical evidence for Jesus, you know, outside of the Bible. And so um, I, I say that all to say God can and does use uh you know, arguments to bring people to him. Of course, it's not the gospel. Um, it's the gospel that saves and God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we would not say apologetics replaces the preaching or proclamation of the gospel. Apologetics is a branch of Christian theology that seeks to defend the truth of the Christian religion using logic, philosophy, science, reason, history, etc. So I am a student at Southern Evangelical Seminary, so my biggest mentor as far as apologetics goes, you hear our brother here talk about uh, Montgomery, and my other brother over here studied under Dr. Walter Martin. For me, my biggest influence was Dr. Uh, Norman Geisler. I mean, he just had a, a massive influence uh, on me. Uh, and so a lot of the, kind of my method, more of the classical apologetics, uh, really comes more from that. So you guys will see a lot of references uh, to him in that. So let's look at some of the, the biblical basis, uh, the theological basis, and the rational basis. So. Uh, as our friend Ace had already commented, 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope uh, that you have. So this, uh, you know, always be prepared to give a reason, always be prepared to give an answer. Um, you know, sometimes when I, when I talk to Christians or I ask Christians, why do you believe Christianity is true? Or why do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? You may hear something like, well, because um, it's, it's how I was born. I was born into a, a Christian home, and it's just what I've always been taught. Um, so people can be in the right worldview and have the right beliefs, even if it's not really justified, true belief, or grounded. Um, but if you ask, you know, have you, you know, have you, could, could you be wrong about that? How do you know that it's true? What about the, the Muslim who grows up, you know, in his area and has always been, you know, taught uh, Islamic doctrine? Uh, obviously, that, that itself wouldn't make it true. So there are reasons outside of that. Um, I was talking to a young lady yesterday as we were tabling, and I was explaining what we do. And said, you know, I'd love to have you have you come. We're going to be looking at is the Bible true? Is there you know contradictions and in, in answering those? And she says, well, I know Christianity is true. I know that the Bible's true. And I said, well, how do you know that? And she says, well, through experience. And I asked her, well, what about um, what about the Muslim who's also had s certain experiences that they use to justify their belief that Islam is true? Um, how would you, if as an outsider, how would you kind of adjudicate, how would you determine what one is right if both are appealing to experience? We said, yeah, good question. And, you know, took a card and hopefully we'll see her this semester. So, you know, we want to be able to have good reasons. We want to be able to have good answers. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people just don't know that there are good answers and good reasons. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen needeth not be uh, ashamed. You know, we, we, um, we're here at a university and we take time to study, uh, you know, whether it's uh, biology or history or English. Devote our lives to these things hours and hours and hours studying these things. But for some reason, for a lot of people, 
theology is just an afterthought. You know, God's just going to drop it into your head. You don't need to know how to do hermeneutics or exegesis or uh, systematic theology or any of these other disciplines. It's just not important. But, you know, as a believer, as a Christian, if you think about this, we say, you know, what's more important, spiritual food or physical food, right? Well, obviously the spiritual food, right? So, it's good that we, um, God has given us our minds and, and it's good that we're at these universities and it's good that we're studying these disciplines, but we shouldn't be any less about our study of the things of God. We should, uh, and, and when we do that, you know, when we're looking at the sciences, when we're looking at philosophy, when we're looking at history, we shouldn't see this, um, kind of, you know, as an example, growing up, I would go to Sunday school and I would hear stories about Noah and the Ark or something like that. And you have these depictions of all these, you know, big animals, elephants, giraffes, they're all crammed into a little bathtub, right, for example. Well, that's, what does that communicate? You know, that's, that's communicating this is a fairy tale. This didn't really happen. This is, this is just a story. Uh, and so for me, when I went to school and I'm in science class, I'm learning one thing. I'm thinking, well, this is the real world. This is science. This is a discipline. But then when you go to church and, and even though it's hitting on scientific issues, it's almost like it's a separate domain and you put this in a whole other category. And I guess what I'm saying is all truth is God's truth. Um, if you look at the major branches of science, most of them were Christians. Uh, I believe all of them were theists of some sort. And it was this idea that the universe is rational uh, and that they wanted to know the mind of God. So they didn't see a con conflict between faith and reason or science uh, and, and religion. Now, certain religions do contradict science, right? There's some that would deny the universe uh, had a beginning and there's, you know, all kind of crazy religions out there. So I'm not saying science and religion don't, don't conflict. I would say science and Christianity don't, though, because all truth is God's truth. And if that's the case, we shouldn't fear philosophy, we shouldn't fear history, and we should, definitely shouldn't fear science either, right? So study to show ourselves approved. One of my other uh, favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 10.5. Uh, Since we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it uh, obedient to Christ. So sometimes people think of arguing as, uh, as a bad thing. You know, that, well, I'm not going to, and I've heard Christians, I'm not going to argue with you, I'm not going to argue about it. Or they'll even, some will say, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, we do a lot of ministry with Jehovah's Witnesses. And so they say, well, um, you know, uh, it's better, you know, I'm not going to win the argument rather than the person, right? As though uh, it's okay to lose the argument to win the person. If I'm arguing with a Jehovah's Witness about the person of Jesus, whether he's Michael the Archangel or God the Son, is that an argument I can afford to lose? <laughs> like if I give that up, if I say, okay, well, I don't want to lose the person, so I'll concede that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, what have I won them to, right? I haven't won them to anything. I've given them uh, bad theology, right? And so um, we don't want to be argumentative necessarily, right? The way we approach things, our demeanor, we want to be loving, we want to be graceful, uh, we want to be kind, but at the same time, um, we should care about truth and we should care about people. You know, if I love people, I'm going to will their best. And from a Christian perspective, the best that I could will for anybody is to be united to the person of Jesus Christ. And so, um, you know, certain things, yeah, you know, if it's, a, if it's a debate, if me and him are having a debate on baptism or Calvinism or something like that, you know, we're not going to come to blows and lose our friendship over that. But if it's, you know, with, with a Muslim or somebody else on the doctrine of God, not that um, I'm going to hate the person or come to blows with them, not that. Still love the person, but it's not something I can back down on and just retreat. We have to be willing to uh, defend the faith. And a lot of Christians think that we should take that approach and that, uh, you know, whatever whatever the issue is, it's okay to just back down on that um, to, to love the person. But I'm saying true love doesn't back down on truth. 
Um, you, you have some examples um, in Scripture. This comes from Dr. Geisler's uh, book, The Apologetics of Jesus. He looks at John chapter 10, verses 35 through 38. Of course, this is an in-depth study. This is just some examples in Scripture that we see. Uh, verse 35, if you call them gods to whom the word of God came and Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. Uh, but if I do do them, uh, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. So he's saying, you know, you don't just have to believe the words. You see the miracles. You see the works, right? The miracles confirm a message of God to the people of God, uh, you know, from God himself. And so the miracles uh, are the works of God that testify who God is. Uh, and so he's saying you don't just have to, don't just take the word for it. Uh, you can see the miracles. You can see uh, the works themselves. And there's some other examples there, but we're kind of short on time. So the rational basis, uh, man is made in the image of God. What time is it, Pastor Ware? It's 8.43. 8.43. Man's made in the image of God. Uh, therefore, we're rational beings. Um, unlike the animals, we're able to reflect on the big questions of life. Uh, part of being rational being is having a coherent worldview. Have you guys heard of that term before, uh, worldview? Somebody tell me, what is a, what is a worldview? I know you guys have heard of it before. How you see the world, okay? What are some of the things that make up a worldview? <clears throat> Say that again? Belief system. Belief system. Yeah, things like things like what? Maybe <clears throat> is there an afterlife? You know, uh, is there a heaven? Is there a hell? <clears throat> Uh, is the universe all there is? You know, is there an immaterial realm? Um, <clears throat> what about man? Um, are we just molecules in motion? Is there an immaterial part to man? Um, where do our ethics come from? Where does the uh, moral standard come from? Some of those questions, right, of, how, of, of what makes up a, a worldview. So... Uh, David Noble says, a worldview is a framework from which we view reality. <coughs> Man, you think I'd take a drink and it would help, and take a drink and made it worse. View reality and make sense of life in the world. Uh, it's any ideology, philosophy, theology, movement, or religion that provides an overarching approach to, <coughs> to understanding God, the world, and man's relation to God and the world. So, you know, how we... How we view the world, um, you know, as a as a Christian, our lens should be what Scripture, right, would play a big part of that, right? So when we're looking at particular questions, we're going to answer those questions in light of, well, you know, what does the Bible say about it? Uh, what does what does the biblical worldview say about it? Um, some of the elements of a worldview, things like, uh, again, ultimate reality of the universe, um, the nature of the universe. Is it eternal? Does it have a beginning? Um, again, is it, uh, is it strictly, is nature all there is? Is there such thing as uh, immaterial beings like angels, demons, God? Right? What happens if the atheist is right and naturalism is all there is? Goodbye, God. Goodbye, angels. Goodbye, all of that, right? Nature, nature is all there is. And so <clears throat> everyone has a worldview. Everybody has a worldview, whether you're, you know, um, Muslim or, or a Hindu or an atheist. Everyone has a worldview. Uh, what about the basis of human knowledge? Um, you have, you know, a lot of knowledge we can get from history, from science, from philosophy. What about special revelation, right? Romans 1 talks about a lot of a lot about general revelation what about special revelation that is where god is uh, revealing himself whether it is through prophets or angels you know etc um, do we have you know in, in the christian worldview special revelation is also another source uh, of knowledge why the church uh, should teach apologetics well the christian church has always seen the need to defend orthodoxy uh, from several fronts. 
So you have uh, world religions or cult and slash cults, atheism, relativism, uh, or those who are apostates in the church who cause uh, confusion and division. So there's several fronts from which the Christian apologist has to um, kind of give give some responses to. Just this is kind of quick. We'll just go through this quickly. Some of the notable apologists, because sometimes people don't realize the rich, deep history within Christianity of just amazing uh, theologians and, and uh, philosophers. So obviously St. Augustine, uh, his father converted to Christianity on his deathbed, uh, which came from the persuasion of his wife. His youth, Augustine, followed the unpopular Manichaean religion, of course, to the horror of his mother. Some of his contributions, uh, Theory of Time, in the book Confessions 11, Augustine developed a very uh, provocative concept of time. Uh, Faith-seeking understanding in his sermon, Augustine asserted, uh, I'm not even going to attempt that one, uh, believe in order that you may understand, uh, did some stuff on the ontological argument and uh, response to the problem of evil. A lot of St. Thomas Aquinas's work was based off of uh, Augustine stuff. So a lot of like uh, Augustine, his view of evil and evil being a privation and that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas did a lot of work from Augustine. And I mean, these are big contributions. I mean, these are like giants in the faith. Um, speaking of St. Thomas Aquinas, what do you know? Italian Dominican theologian. Uh, Aquinas was one of the most influential medieval thinkers of scholasticism and the father of the Thomistic school of theology. So again, you know, Ratio Christi, it's, it's a Protestant group, but that doesn't mean we can't learn a lot and take a lot from a lot of, you know, Catholic or Orthodox thinkers, because there is a lot that we share in common. There are some big differences, uh, but there's a lot that we, we have in common. <laughs> So uh, Norm Geisler, as I was telling you guys, president of uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary, recently passed. He was one. He was known as one of the one of the top evangelical Thomist uh, scholars, and so really did a lot of uh, thought after Saint Thomas Aquinas. So of course, his uh, five ways that prove the existence of God. So from motion, uh, third way argument from contingency, just some really some really brilliant. Brilliant thoughts, brilliant, brilliant thinking. If you guys also see everybody taking their phones out, if you guys, uh, I'm not sure where our clipboard is. Is it back there? If you guys want to write your names and emails down, we'll, I'll send you the PowerPoint as well. That way you guys don't have to write everything down. Um, but yeah, Aquinas was a brilliant thinker, contributed um, a lot, a lot to uh, Christian apologetics and philosophy. I move past the St. Anselm, of course, with the ontological argument and some other other stuff. Um, so the church needs uh, apologetics. Again, you have the uh, false religions. Um, some would be in the, the cult section. Um, so Mormonism, uh, and this is not to be, this isn't meant to be mean or rude or attack them, but there are differences. There just are. Um, I grew up in Utah, I lived there for 23 years. My uh, mother and father actually came out of Mormonism. And so there are some big, you know, theological disagreements. And we would say that would actually put them outside of, of uh, Christian orthodoxy. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, another group that uh, deny the doctrine of the Trinity, would say Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Um, uh, now, with the Church of Christ, you have some Church of Christ that are actually Orthodox. But there are some other Church of Christ, just depending upon the Church of Christ, that would say you have to be baptized in their particular church, um, you have to be water baptized, and uh, a few other things. And so we would say with some of the Church of Christ, um, I couldn't in good conscience to some of them send, uh, send people there. Yeah, the United Pentecostal Church, UPC, which is uh, often ca called a oneness or modalist. This is where they uh, deny the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and so that would put them outside the, the bounds of orthodoxy. Uh, and then Christadelphians. You also have other groups. Um, so those would be those that might um, yeah, claim to be Christian, 
but would, we would say deviate um, in one or more of the essentials of the faith. So obviously Mormonism, their view of God, view of Jesus, uh, salvation, etc. Um, and then you have just religions. They don't like Islam, for example, doesn't claim to be Christian, doesn't doesn't claim to be in that you know in that house, uh, but they deny Christian essential doctrine. Obviously, atheism or naturalism, Baha'i, Scientology, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, and the occult. So some would say, you know, well, you have, you know, you have God up here, and you have all these religions here, and they're all climbing to the top. What would you guys say to something like that? Let's get, let you guys do some of the work here. What do you guys think about that? Well, some would say, um, you know, Baha'i, Scientology, different mountains. different mountains, okay. Okay, contradict one another. Okay. Any other, any other thoughts on that? Someone says, well, we're just all there, it's all on our own path to what you, you know, maybe what you, you think God is the God of the Christian, but you have all these other religions and they think their God is the right way. And so it doesn't matter what you call it, as long as you're heading up that mountain. So Scarlet would say, well, you got some issue with contradictions. You're saying, well, it's a different mountain. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. And one of the common ones is everybody's <coughs> actually going toward the same God, but calling by different names. And if that's the case, then God is schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Church needs apologetics because some of the research shows, uh, Cross Examine did a thing on this, 75% of kids who grow up in a Christian home who attend a secular college will completely walk away from the faith after the first year of college. When asked why they no longer believe in Christianity, most said it's due to intellectual objections to the faith. This is, an attack, this is not an attack on secular colleges, right? Because obviously we're at a secular college and we want people who are doctors and you know scientists etc uh, but a lot of the a lot of the studies show what happens is Christians will grow up in a in a church home and they never get outside a particular bubble and they never have they're never challenged they never have their worldview challenged and so a lot of times when they get to college they're hearing these objections for of science or philosophy or history or that the bible is contradictory and a lot of times they don't know how to respond and so um, they may go to their parents and then the parents are thinking well you know, the parent you know, going to go to the pastor because this is kind of his job. And then the pastor is being, you know, having Richard Dawkins and these guys thrown at him. And oftentimes the pastors don't know how to respond. And so a lot of times they get an answer like, well, you, you know, you just have to have faith. You just have to have to believe. And sometimes it's put almost like the more ridiculous the biblical claim is, the more faith you have to have, and the more faith you have to have, the more pious you actually are. So it's a good thing to believe things that are just irrational and ridiculous. But we would say it's not. That, that's not the meaning of faith in the biblical sense, uh, which is more of a trust or a confidence. Um, and you shouldn't believe things that are contradictory and ridiculous. A lot of times it's just assumed that things are ridiculous. I remember meeting with some campus uh, ministers on on this on this campus and over dinner we had some of our students, they had some of their students and these are these are the leaders and they were laughing about the virgin birth and mocking it and saying it was it was stupid and how ridiculous and how, you know, how laughable it is to believe in the virgin birth. And so I spoke up and I said, well, why is it laughable? Why is it ridiculous to believe in the virgin birth? And she's, well, it's, it's just irrational. It's just illogical. You know, as we're sitting there with the students, I said, you know, I, I want you students to, to hear this and understand mockery is not an argument. You know, saying something is stupid does not constitute an argument against a miracle. You have to show, because really that's what it was. It was just an objection against miracles. She has to provide an argument or reasons that we should reject miracles. And so, you know, mockery and stuff like that does not, 
does not count as an ar it's not an argument it's just an assertion so again a lot of times when the students are asked why they why they don't believe or why they're walking away from the faith a lot of them say it's because of a lot of the intellectual objections that come now it's not all of it you know there is this sense where people want to do what they want to do you know at the end of the day and sometimes people will use an intellectual argument as a smoke screen because i've had it where when you blow those smoke screens up they still don't want to they still don't want to bend the knee they still don't want to serve christ uh, one of the things that frank turek uh, often does is when he's talking with a student or uh, or an atheist or someone whoever it is he'll say if it was proven that Christianity was true, if it can be shown that Christianity was true, would you worship uh, the Christian God? And he says, oftentimes, they say no, they wouldn't. So, you know, it's, it's again, it's not, a, it's not a mission of to find the truth. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's a happiness quest, not a truth quest. So if it can be shown that something is true and you still don't want to believe it, I mean, you know, I don't know how, how far much further you can go uh, at that point. So, you know, a lot of times the church is losing ground, um, so uh, people will avoid apologetics and doctrine. Uh, and some people think apologetics and that is just something that, you know, academics do, but in reality it's something that all, all Christians should do. All Christians should engage in apologetics. All Christians uh, should want to study to show themselves approved. Because again, you know, the goal is, um, at least I'm hoping to communicate this with you guys when we leave the when we leave this room you guys are going to have encounters with people on the campus outside of the campus with your family etc that are not believers that may have questions uh, and you guys are in a position where you guys are going to get some really good answers got some really good people that are going to be teaching and going over some really good stuff so we don't want to just you know keep it in the classroom and and uh be a bunch of eggheads because I've seen it go two ways. One, you have people all they want to do is study philosophy, theology, and they never do anything with it, right? It just turns into this, you know, philosophizing the whole time. And then you get others who don't want to spend any time reading the Bible, don't want to spend any time studying theology or history or philosophy, but they want to go out and do evangelism. But then they, they meet people that are just tearing them to shreds because they have a zeal without knowledge. So my goal is... Let's, why can't you have both? Why can't you have both? Why can't you, for me, as I study this stuff and I learn more and more and more about the Christian faith, it makes me passionate to want to get out and tell people about the truth, the truth of the Bible, the truth of Christ, uh, because, uh, you know, I want to see people come to know the Savior. What time we got, buddy? Wow, we got a minute. All right. So I will I will send you guys this PowerPoint to those who would like it. Let me get to the end here. So conclusion. Well, we need apologetics. Well, first, because then this is a paper Dr. Geisler wrote called um, Apolog apologetics of Jesus, I think, something to that effect. Uh, God commands it, reason demands it, and the world needs it. So an ambassador's creed, this comes from Stan to Reason, Greg Kokel's ministry. He gives a few really good keys here in order to be a good ambassador. This would be something I'd like to instill in you guys, you know, as you leave here and, and uh, the weeks to come. In order to be a good ambassador for Christ, first you've got to have knowledge. That is, you have to have an accurate mind. You must have some basic knowledge. Minimally, he must know the character, mind, and purpose of his king. How do we do that? Got to read the Bible, right? Got to read the Bible. Study some theology. Uh, pray. That's important as well. Second, wisdom. Uh, wisdom is an artful method. Knowledge must be deployed in a skillful way. There's an element of wisdom, tactical and artful diplomacy that makes his message persuasive. You know, I've been around some real smart Christians who are brilliant at you know theology and biblical arguments, and you know I think of you know one that uh, you know I spent a lot of time with. Um, he had a Jehovah's Witness come into his house and. Uh, Man, the meeting was going well, and for whatever reason, he just turns into this total jerk and 
throws the Jehovah's Witness out of his house, slams the door, almost like, uh, you know, like I just won the fight. And it's like, it was such a turnoff. It was so, it was, I've never forgot it. I was like, you know, 12, 13 years ago. I've never forgot that. And I always think about that because you have the knowledge, uh, but what they don't teach you in seminary or Bible college necessarily is this idea of wisdom. Uh, it's it's being charitable. It's it's wanting to hear what the other person says. It's wanting to care about people. You know, people know if you are just using the Bible as a weapon to hurt them and beat them with, or if you're really looking at them in the eyes and with love, explaining, you're wrong. This is why you're wrong. And I don't want you to be wrong. I want you to be, you know, on the side of truth. People know the difference between someone like the Westboro Baptist Church uh, and someone like a pastor where, you know, people know the difference. Character, that's another one. Uh, because an ambassador brings himself along in everything he does, personal maturity and individual virtue can either make or break the message. These are all very, very important characteristics in order to be a good ambassador. Any thoughts, any questions, anything before we close? Any final thoughts? Jacob, <laughs> any words of wisdom back there? No, no, I, I agree with everything. Like, about, like, that's why I didn't have any questions or concern or anything. I just because I think a lot of Christians. I mean, I feel like when we learn all this information, I think we also need again tactical, tactical about like sharing that information. We don't want to come out too. Um, right. Or yeah. Like that. And I don't know, totally agree with that. All right. Uh, next week, Pastor Ware, you're up, right? What are you going to be speaking on? Well, I figured since uh, fo- the uh, the focus uh, this semester is going to be on the Bible, that I'd take you all through the whole Bible. The Bible in an hour. From Genesis to Revelation. Uh, that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to we're going to try to get at what is the central message of Holy Scripture and how does that uh, find its way through all of, of Scripture. So yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to see if I can cover it all in an hour. It's okay. Looking forward to that. That'll be a good Bible study. All right, guys, I'll have Pastor Ware actually end us in prayer. We got pizza, soda. Feel free to hang around for a bit and...